on air. You can go ahead and have a seat. Good morning. We're glad to have all of you here this morning, all of you that are physically present, all of you joining our live stream, perhaps while you're traveling and kicking off your summer vacations. Who knows what it is? We're glad you're here. So we had our, our, our junior and senior high groups get back from their Christ and Youth conferences this week, both age groups. So there's some tired kids here and some tired adult volunteers, no less. But uh, we're all here. We're here this morning to celebrate anyway. You might see some sleepy eyes and maybe even some nodding off here and there during my message. But then again, what else is new? So we are <laughs> we're, we're wrapping up our Words with Friends message series this morning. 
Um, and starting next Sunday, we're going to be kicking off a new series called Signs and Wonders. And this is going to be a series where each week we're going to be hearing a message from some of those in leadership here at uh, NHCC as they each share their, their heart and their preparation about one of Jesus' miracles recorded in the Gospels. And the tireless James Knox is going to get a break from band leading for these weeks, um, and I'll be leading the music during that time. So looking forward to some fresh voices uh, and some fresh insight. I think it's going to be a great series for us. But speaking of next Sunday, I want to give everyone an important update about our next step in navigating this whole COVID season we've been in and how that affects our Sundays together, all right? So we've been watching, we've been looking at trends, not only health trends like we've always been doing, but trends at how things have gone these past five or six weeks with this style of, of registering. Um, and after touching base with some other, some trusted medical professionals, we're making the following changes starting next Sunday, next Sunday, July 4th. Here's how it's gonna work. The rear half of this sound booth side of the sanctuary will remain with X'd off every other pew as a place for restricted seating for those who still need the assurance of distancing and masks. That's required. That will be in that same rear section of that side. But then the entire rest of the pews, this front half and this side, will all be available, not X'd off, all be available for everyone to sit wherever and however they want. The idea is I think that maybe gives a little more room for some spacing and some comfort instead of everyone sitting shoulder to shoulder, but there's room in front of you, all right? So that's in place next weekend. And one last thing, wait for it, we are no longer requiring registration starting next week. You just show up. Remember that like back in the old days? <laughs> Pretty exciting. So that is next Sunday, that's July 4th. Um, and for the holiday, no formal kids programming next week. Parents of kids, you probably already know that. But we'll be sending out emails this week just to, just to refresh all that information and give you any final details. That's starting holiday weekend next Sunday. We'll continue our live stream. That's business as usual. Um, and yes, we're, we're continuing to ask that those who've not been vaccinated to wear masks regardless of where you choose to sit. But this is an exciting big step forward for all of us. That being said, why don't we all stand up and continue worshiping this morning.
God, thank you for that incredible love that we just sung about, that love that makes everything new, that love that invites us to surrender, to be restored, to experience your abundance. God, thank you that that love invites us to respond, to listen, to be molded, to be shaped, to be restored. May that love carry us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
You can go ahead and be seated. Like I said, we're, we're wrapping up uh, our Words with Friends series this morning that we've been in for the last month and a half or so. We've spent some time looking at words, meaningful, life-giving words, words that God uses to speak to us through His Word, words that can impart life and healing and hope and direction in our relationships, in our faith journeys. They can be life-changing if we let them take root in our lives. So quick review. Week one was the word love, God's love. Love is who God is. It's not about our performance or what we bring to the table. And understanding how God defines love is actually foundational to understanding God. That was also true in our word in the second week, which was grace. Grace was that word. God's forgiveness and provision and presence and sustaining promise that carries us from day to day. Thorns and all. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. That was week two. <clears throat> week three was the word truth. Because we're, we're told that Jesus came from the Father with grace and truth. And ultimately, that truth isn't simply the concept of some kind of an idea or philosophy. It's a person. It's Jesus himself. The way, the truth, and the life. Week four, Tony shared with us about the word trust. And then last week, we heard from Pastor Carey, regional director and leader of the Pittsburgh chapter of Days for Girls, to talk to us about the word mission and the work that organization as a, does as a snapshot of how Jesus loosens the chains of injustice and elevates the value of women, women in cultures that cast them aside. That was week five. And then last week on Father's Day, we looked at the word commitment. Because in a culture of convenience and disposables and consumerism, that word has kind of lost its shimmer, right? And yet, our relationships show us how starved we really are for godly commitment and faithfulness fleshed out in our lives. So that brings us up to today. And this morning, we're going to close out with one last word. Uh, maybe you remember how last week I opened the message on commitment by saying how God kind of gives us two gifts two powers, if you will, for dealing with the past and the future. Commitment is that power for dealing with the future. And I said that forgiveness is the power to deal with our past and how it affects our present. So that's how we're going to close out our series this morning, spending time <clears throat> looking at that word forgiveness. Now, those of you who are parents, especially if you're a parent of a teenager, <clears throat> uh, this, this past year or so, has been absolutely brutal for students as they've tried to pursue academic learning in, in ways that they've never really experienced before. Now, there's still plenty of info yet to, to fully be studied, but some experts have said this past school year, we're seeing on average, on average, a nationwide drop of an entire letter grade in students' overall GPA numbers. That's the average. Some students have managed to adapt well and come out in decent shape, and many others haven't been so lucky. Teachers have had to work to adapt and to, to, to sudden and strange teaching environments. So, of course, not all of them are going to be on their A game, of course. And students have to pivot to that, trying to learn in these all virtual environments and then partially in person and all these transitions. It's been an incredibly difficult year that has so many high schoolers, especially, feeling like they've, they've ruined their futures. Maybe a year that they've been told was so instrumental in their academic and professional lives ended up being a train wreck. And we now have record numbers of students nationwide in counseling, in treatment for depression and anxiety, worried about how these struggles and mistakes in their rearview mirror are going to impact their future, their plans, their dreams. And I think some of what we're going to say today, <clears throat> what we're going to see about this word forgiveness has the ability to bring some direction and speak life and comfort to those kind of experiences. But before we get to that word, speaking of students, <clears throat> I want to do something that many students have actually missed out on through this past year plus. And that's simply having friends and communities celebrate with them, commemorate those important life markers with them like graduation. So I just want to take a minute to mention those students here in the NHCC family that have graduated this past academic year, whether from high school or from some level of collegiate studies. Just going to go through each of them and ask that we hold any applause until we're through the list, okay? Here we go. 
As far as high school graduates go, we have Tony Nicasio, who graduated this year from Pine Richland High School, uh, has plans to attend Lock Haven University with a focus in computer science, and of course, as a kicker for the football team. We also have, have Ben Lezak, who graduated from North Hills High School and will be studying information systems and technology at Pittsburgh Technical College this fall. In the collegiate world, we have Logan Glace, who graduated from Penn State with a degree in civil engineering and recently took a local position with LSSE civil engineers and surveyors. We have Jacob Balbach, who graduated from the University of Pittsburgh, majoring in economics and public and professional writing with a minor in legal studies. He's going to be continuing his education at the University of North Carolina School of Law in August. We have Josie Landis, who graduated from the College of William and Mary with a BA in Business Administration with majors in Accounting and Masters of Accounting. She'll be working for Ernst & Young in Governmental Audit based in Washington, D.C. And finally, we have Yasmin White, who graduated from Baldwin Wallace University and will be spending time in Germany with plans to return after a year to become a teacher. Can we show all of our graduates some support and encouragement as we celebrate them this morning? Now, I'm sure each and every one of them could testify as to how brutal the shifts and demands and changing landscape of this past year was for them in their studies. And so our word today, forgiveness, is sorely needed for many of us as we, we long to move past the ugliness and pains of our past. In old Roman ruins, uh, archaeologists have discovered these, uh, these prayer tablets. These were ancient prayers to pagan gods that people would pay to have inscribed on like a thin metal tablet. There's a picture of that, one of those up there. This was around the time of Jesus where the Roman cultures around them very strongly believed that they could exercise control over the natural world by tapping into the divinity of these pagan gods. So these tablets with prayers were often called curse tablets because the most common kind of prayer recorded on them by far are curses. Prayers to the pagan gods to bring harm or pain or suffering or failure to someone they felt had wronged them. People would have a message inscribed to a god or a goddess that would say something like, this person here hurt me, here is how they hurt me, and here's what I want their revenge to look like. Tablets like these have been found all over the Mediterranean region. Curse tablets. The most common prayer recorded on these tablets in the ancient world, by far, curses. But what about another category? What about uh, a bless my enemy tablet? What about those? A prayer that says, this person hurt me badly. Uh, would you please deliver me from my resentment? Help that person to find genuine repentance. Forgive their sin and mine. Heal our relationship. What about that kind of prayer tablet? Seems, seems healthy, right? Let me tell you how many tablets like that they have found in the thousands they've uncovered in the ancient world. Exactly zero. People didn't pray prayers like that. Fierce allegiance to friends and family and fierce opposition to your enemies was just considered proper, noble even. It's how things worked in that culture. And into that world, into that culture came a carpenter from this tiny village of Nazareth who had a lot to say about forgiveness. It was pretty countercultural then. And if we're being honest, it's still pretty countercultural now. And see, that's because Jesus was always tuned into his mission. It's why he said in John 3, 16 and 17, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus never strayed from his mission of wanting to connect people back to God and to discover that life that he offers. It's the same mission that's echoed later on in 2 Peter when we read, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And Jesus himself once articulated his mission this way in John 10.10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. See, when Jesus talks about forgiveness, he is on mission to point us to experience that life of abundance. 
that freedom of healing made possible by God's love. And he was so driven by that mission that he became the sacrifice on the cross for our sins, our mistakes, those ways that we've missed the mark and need to experience God's forgiveness through Jesus. I think a great singular example of Jesus modeling God's forgiveness in life and action, and there are many, but one of them is the story of the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. And we've talked about this before, so I'm not going to go into all the detail. But it's a story of a woman with a pretty questionable past, plenty of mistakes and life habits that were not that abundant life that Jesus desires for us, that God desires. And Jesus seeks her out. He starts a conversation with her in John 4. For today's purposes, here's what I want you to know about the story. Jesus doesn't scold her. He doesn't come with judgment. Even though he, of all people, could have. He could have come with judgment. He never soft-steps her sin. Not at all. But he doesn't condemn. Rather, he invites her to discover truth, to expand her understanding of God. He dares her to experience a life redefined, living his way. Here's why I bring that up. Don't you think it's ironic then that we serve this Jesus as our Lord, the one who says that he does not come to condemn, that his life example is not, is not one of condemning? I think it's ironic then that one of the things that non-churchgoers so often say about their experience with church is that people are so judgmental and condemning. Jesus, the one who was without sin, who had the right to correctly judge and to condemn, he said that's not why he came. We hear John 3.16 quoted all the time, but John 3.17 is often left out. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Look, Christians have struggled with this for centuries. Over my 25 years or so in ministry, I have seen so many instances where Christian parents, as they see, we'll say, unwonderful behaviors in their kids, they crack down. They think their kid needs more judgment, more condemnation, needs to hear that message louder and more often to correct them of their ways. Except what you see over and over is the exact opposite. Kids raised in homes where judgment and condemnation and shame were pushed hardest to try to reform the kids, those are the kids most likely to walk away from the faith to reject God's way of abundant living because they've only heard about His anger, His judgment, His rules, and they've never understood His tenderness and His grace. I can't even count the number of premarital counseling sessions that I've done where this comes up when we talk about family of origin and faith. It's heartbreaking. Now listen, God's righteousness and holiness and judgment are real. That's why Jesus came. He came that we might experience life God's way. And it's not a life of shame and burdens and condemnation. It's a, it's a life of freedom and of flourishing. Maybe that's why Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, and 30, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." And maybe it's why the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 2.4, Do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Forgiveness is God's gift to us that frees us from our chains, frees us from our heavy burdens of, of religious performance, our slavery to sin. It's not a freedom to get off scot-free and do whatever we want without consequence. It's a freedom to step into God's way of living without feeling like we have to constantly live in shame and regret and punishment. If you've put your trust in Jesus, your shame and regret were crucified on that cross with Him. Stop trying to bring Him back to life. Now, if you've been coming to church for a while, when you think about the word forgiveness, that's probably how you're used to hearing about it at church, right? God forgiving us. And that's absolutely a crucial and a freeing part of the Word, one that restores us, one that washes us clean from our sin through Jesus' work on the cross. But there's a really big other piece with this word forgiveness. So big, in fact, that it's the primary way 
that Jesus himself talked about this word. And it's how we're going to spend the rest of our time together this morning. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 5, starting in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Some of you, you gulped hard right now when I read that. Ethan, I brought my parents today. My friend is watching the live stream. I thought this was going to be a feel-good message about how all of our mess-ups can be washed away. Can you go back to that, please? Please talk about that instead. Listen, this is real life. Anger and hurt and bitterness and resentment, they are huge forces in our world. It's real and familiar to every single one of us. And nobody sitting in this room gets a free pass. Nobody. It might be hard to hear, but we're diving in anyway. Jesus continues in the next verse. If you love only those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? If you're only showing love and care and kindness to those that make you feel good, How is that different than what anyone else does? If you only greet and seek out those you know that are already in your circle, already in your tribe, how is that different from the rest of the world around you? Jesus is just describing how the world around him worked. He wants to show how God's kingdom come to earth should look different in contrast. And he chooses this illustration as simple as greeting another person. Jesus was a master at this. He used common familiar, everyday things to expertly illustrate difficult truths. You ever been to a church where, a service where they asked you to get up and greet the people around you? Something we've done here for years, at least pre-COVID, right? Very common thing in churches. They do that with with the visitors too, right? If you're an extrovert, you love that time. You want to go and hug everybody and talk until the worship leader yells at you to sit down. But, But if you're an introvert, or if you're a first-time visitor, those are the times you just want to sprint for the door and never come back. But have you ever, how about this? Have you ever heard of a, of a church greeting time where everyone's asked to stand and greet people that they can't stand? Greet the people they're carrying resentment over? Doesn't seem too common to me. And we like to try new things here at this church. So what do you say we give that a try? I'm going to ask you here in a minute to get up and find someone you really have a hard time with someone you really wish wasn't even here this morning, and go greet them. Everybody got it? Everybody ready? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't do that. Some of you are like, whew, that was close. That was going to get ugly. How incredibly awkward would that be, right? But, but Jesus picked something as simple as this to make his point about forgiveness. And Jesus taught about it this way quite often. There's a scene in Matthew 18 where Peter has been wronged or hurt by someone. And he comes at Jesus and he says, it says, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? Peter was thinking he was being all noble. Up to seven times, that's a lot. Jesus said, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Then there's the Lord's Prayer. There's that line we're all familiar with. Even if you didn't grow up, didn't grow up going to church, you've heard this. Jesus prays in Matthew 6, 12, Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Ever thought about that little word, as? That's a scary word, isn't it? (laughs) Uh, Well, Ethan, maybe that was some kind of translation mistake or something. Isn't the Lord's Prayer also recorded in Luke's Gospel? I know it's a lot shorter there. Maybe Jesus' words there sound a little easier to take in that one. What do you say? All right, you want Luke's Gospel? Because you're right, the Lord's Prayer recorded in Luke's Gospel, it's barely more than two verses long. It's much shorter. Except the one part of the prayer that really isn't shortened is the part on forgiveness. Jesus prays this in Luke 11:4, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Everyone who sins against us. Ethan, what the heck? That's worse. What are you doing? Here, maybe this will help shed some light on things. Jesus ends the Lord's prayer in Matthew 6, and immediately 
When he finishes, we read this starting in verse 14 of Matthew 6. He says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. What? Jesus can't mean that, literally, right? Surely there's some some historical nuance, some language translation tools that can soften this. Please tell me there's something, Ethan. What does this verse really mean? Well, I think it means if you don't forgive others their sins, then God will not forgive your sins. It's a message we see over and over throughout Scripture. It's as simple as, as, the, as in, verse, in Ephesians 4.32 that just says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, I just want to be clear. Forgiveness is talked about in a variety of ways throughout Scripture, okay? I'm not going to stand up here and claim to have figured out the divine inner workings of how God conducts His universe. There is certainly a profound mystery, a divinity in how God forgives us through the sacrifice of His Son. But an undeniable part of that mystery is that us being forgiven by God is very much connected to our forgiveness of others. While the heart of Jesus' words here in Matthew and in the Lord's Prayer and all over the rest of the New Testament, they're not the only way the Scriptures talk about forgiveness, but they are given the strongest and the most frequent treatment in God's Word. The message is unavoidable. God forgiving us is connected to us forgiving others. Now, let's be clear. Forgiveness does not mean forget, condone, sidestep, excuse, tolerate, overlook, none of that. Forgiveness is about choosing the way of love over the way of hate. It's just a better way to do life. It's not easy. In fact, it might be painful. It takes time. But Jesus says that if you want to be forgiven, you better be willing to forgive others. Words like like grace and love that we've talked about in this series, we like those words. We like the word forgiveness too at least until it's required by us, right? We love to hear about how God forgives us, His unconditional love and His grace. We take communion every week like we're going to do in just a bit later, where we remember how Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sins. We love to remember that God is still in the forgiving business. But we so often struggle to offer the same forgiveness we've been shown. Maybe you have a really difficult situation And you have very real, very understandable reasons for not wanting to extend forgiveness. Yet there are countless stories through history of Christians who found God's love and forgiveness to give to others despite unspeakable pain and wrongs done against them. There are stories throughout history that do that. Read the story of the Ten Boom family during Nazi Germany who hid Jews from Nazi soldiers and they suffered in concentration camps as a result and yet shared their faith with many others and experienced the freedom in forgiving their oppressors. There's some incredible stuff in some journals that Corey Ten Boom has written about that. There's a story like one that was in the news years ago about a Christian mother who forgave and befriended the young man who murdered her son. It's a heart-wrenching story. It's honestly hard to read. But the mother said this, Unforgiveness is like cancer. It will eat you from the inside out. It's not about that other person. Me forgiving him does not diminish what he's done to my son. But the forgiveness is for me. I want to spend the rest of our time on a passage that I believe this mother and the Ten Boon family and many others had come to understand. This is Jesus talking in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus says, You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Of course, we get this. Somebody murders someone, there's consequences, just like that was for the young man who murdered that mother's son. And my guess is when Jesus spoke these words to his audience, he probably got a lot of head nods, maybe even heard a few amens. All those who had never murdered anyone or committed any of those giant, like, criminal-grade sins. They're shouting, preach it, Jesus! But Jesus wasn't done. He says in the next verse, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. 
the language here, the words that Jesus is, that he uses, suggest a state of remaining angry, of feeding or maintaining a posture of anger. Not so much a single moment of feeling angry. This is a word that's best described as anger that has settled into place. It's a great way to say it. Anger that had settled into place. An anger that actively burned against the offender. It's not an anger really about the moral offense itself. It's about the offender. So the message here, Jesus is saying, if you murder, there's judgment, there's consequences. And if you remain angry, if you smolder with anger and hold bitterness, there is judgment and consequences. You can almost hear the, uh, the I have never murdered anyone crowd get real quiet when Jesus dropped that one. What Jesus is doing here is he's taking God's command to not murder and he's pulling back the curtain to show the heart behind why that commandment was given in the first place. God said, don't murder because people are deeply valuable to him. Jesus would later say you can sum up all those commandments in basically two phrases, love God and love people. The purpose of the law, do not murder, is to protect people because people are valuable and dearly loved by God. Jesus says everyone knows if you physically murder someone, there's consequences, there's judgment. But then he says, when you're burning with anger and resentment for someone, feeding that anger, holding a grudge, there will also be judgment. (coughs) Excuse me. There's consequences for that too. In fact, if you look at all of verse 22, it reads like this. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother is answerable to the Sanhedrin. Anyone who says, you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, before you get all worked up over that fire of hell phrase, let's talk about what's being communicated here. Because remember, like I've said so many times before, what matters is what Jesus was communicating to his original listeners that matters. And that can, in turn, communicate God's truth to us. You see, in religious day, in Jesus' day, religious law said that uh, if you use your words to cut down, to devalue another person, they could technically charge you before a court of religious law. That was the Sanhedrin, a court of religious law. You could have judgment actually sentenced on you. Maybe it was a fine. Uh, You'd maybe be made to work for that person. Could be a, a variety of things. That was this culture. Jesus comes into that culture and he says, if you devalue someone, you hold a grudge against someone, if you carry resentment and feed anger for someone, If you will not forgive, you have a bigger problem than facing the religious courts. And then he drops that phrase, the fire of hell. Wait a minute. Is Jesus saying that if I carry resentment towards my ex, or if, let's just say, a pastor happens to get a few frustrated words out at that guy that cuts him off in McKnight and forces him to slam on his brakes, hypothetically speaking, that if that happens that we're destined for eternal punishment that we're going to burn in hell? Let's take that conversation about hell, that place of eternal damnation. Let's just table that over here for a minute to get a better picture of what Jesus is saying to his audience that day. In this passage, Jesus uses a term that referred to an actual place outside of Jerusalem. It was called Gehenna, or the Valley of Hinnom. It was basically the city dump, and it was always on fire. See, that's the way you got rid of things in these cultures. You burned them. You see this practice in some countries and regions even still today. This was a a valley where everything was always burning, from garbage to the bodies of the deceased who couldn't afford a proper burial. Always burning, and it smelled horrible. Add to that, the military would sometimes take prisoners here for punishment and torture. This place even had a reputation as being a place where ancient cults and spiritists would do unspeakable things with human bodies here in this valley. Simply speaking, it was an awful, dreaded, horrible place. And all of that reputation, all of that imagery, all of the sights and smells of that valley would have been an immediately unforgettable reference to those listening to Jesus that day. That's what they would have heard here They wouldn't necessarily have been making a jump to Jesus talking about eternal punishment, even though that's something that phrase would come to be used as occasionally. But I think there's something to this, something to Jesus' reference to the burning city dump 
that would have been so real to Jesus' audience that day, so real that they would have grimaced. They knew that place. They knew what happened there. They knew what you see there. They knew what it smelled like. I think there's something to this. I want you to stay with me. Think of it this way. <clears throat> if you murder someone, there's judgment and consequence. Maybe prison, maybe more. But when you let anger and resentment for someone burn and smolder, there's a danger of another kind of prison, kind of a stench-filled, fiery hell on earth. Some of you listening this morning know exactly what I'm talking about. And it comes back to what that mother whose son was murdered came to terms with. See, here's the thing. Jesus came to give us eternal life, but that's not the only reason he came. Jesus also came to give us a better life now, to give this hurting planet a glimpse of God's kingdom brought to earth. And so many of us miss out. Some of us are making our lives a living fire of smoldering torment because we can't forgive someone who wronged us. We expect God and often even others to forgive us, to give, forgive every single one of our mess-ups in life. But we struggle to forgive that coworker, or that nosy opinionated neighbor or that mother-in-law that just gets under our skin. Little things. Some of you maybe fan the flames of anger at your parents and how you think they should have been better parents or, or at that person that inflicted deep wounds on you as a child. And the more you remain in anger, the worse your valley of fire gets on earth. I hate the person that blew up my family. I can't stand that lazy worker who got my promotion by kissing up to the boss. I am furious and fed up with the person who has made my life a living hell and I can't and won't get over it. That doesn't sound much like the life Jesus longs for us to have, does it? That verse we read earlier, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The life that Jesus calls us to is so much more than just don't murder. Forgiveness is about living free of the fiery prison of bitterness, of anger and pain. You might say to me, but Ethan, I am angry about what happened to me and I have a right to be. I, it was wrong. You can't take that from me. Look, I understand. God understands. I'd be mad too. I mean, I have a hard enough time not getting mad at my kids when they leave their dirty laundry on the floor, for goodness sake. Trust me, I get it. If we're talking about rights, many of you have the right to be angry because what happened to you was wrong. Did you just need someone to tell you that? Fine. But just because you have a right to be angry doesn't mean that's God's intention for your life to stay there. Because a life held captive by anger and resentment is just not God's design for how to experience living life His way on earth. So sure, go ahead and live angry. But Jesus says, be careful. Because there are very real consequences in that. Consequences that rob you of joy and freedom. And even cause you to inflict on others some of the same hurt that was inflicted on you in the first place. We've all seen this. You can be angry at that kiss-up co-worker and take it out on your wife when you get home. You may be angry at that ex-spouse who walked out on you and that resentment is destroying the marriage you're in right now. You can be so smoldering with anger about the failings of your father that it negatively affects the way you treat your children today. You can become so imprisoned by this anger at the people and the wrongs in your life that before too long, God feels like he's a million miles away. He's there, but it's too hard to feel his presence in that smoldering stench of a dumpster fire you've been cultivating for so long. So sure, you've got a right to be angry, but is that where you want to live? Jesus says, be careful, because there is a cost. There is a consequence. Jesus says there's a much better way to live. Not easier, better, and it's called forgiveness. Forgive, or you will continue to suffer the consequences of your own unforgiveness. Maybe it's no accident then that when we look at the scene where, where Jesus himself was shouldering the horrors of the brutality and the wrongs committed against him as he was being nailed to the cross, 
He says simply in Luke twenty two thirty four, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We're going to center our hearts and minds right there this morning as we close in a time of communion. Communion is our time every week to look to the cross in gratefulness and recognition and celebration of how our chains were broken and the walls of our prisons of sin and destruction were broken down through Jesus' sacrifice on that cross. Jesus said to his closest friends, his disciples, when they gathered with him before being crucified, he shared a simple meal together and Jesus said to them, as often as you gather in my name, do this in remembrance of me. So that's what we do. We use bread and juice as ceremonial symbols of Jesus' body and blood given up for us. This morning, you can use the self-service packets you picked up on your way in. Or for those joining us online, you can use elements you may have at home. We invite everyone who puts their trust in Jesus to participate. And if you're unsure of that this morning, just use this time for personal reflection. Let's pray and then take communion together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. We are so in awe of the degree of your love for us. The capacity you have to forgive. God, we long for our hearts to be aligned with yours. As your son prayed on the cross, as he's being beaten and executed and tortured, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. God, give us that heart, that perspective. May your work on the cross protect us and save us from living in a fiery hell on earth, from the consequences of our own resentment. God, thank you for your love that liberates all of that. May we embrace that this morning as we remember the cross. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take communion together.
It's through the work, um, work on the cross, Jesus, that he did, and through him alone that, that we find our strength, our freedom, our healing, and not only our forgiveness, but ultimately our power to forgive others with the same forgiveness that's been granted us. What's a place this morning where you need to make a decision, need to mark some line in the sand in your faith journey, in your relationship with God, or in your relationship with others even? Have you stepped into God's forgiveness through His Son in the first place? Have you surrendered your life to Him by being baptized, being buried to the old self, symbolically underwater, being raised anew? That was the step of every able-bodied person in the New Testament that put their trust in Jesus. Have you taken that step? There were some decisions that were made at the Christ and Youth Conferences this past week where our, our own students and youth have, taken, have, been, have been working through some decisions in that step. You'll hear more, more about that in coming weeks. What is yours? Have you taken that step? What are some relationships for you that desperately need God's kingdom brought to earth? Where do you need to let God release you from that fiery prison of anger and resentment? Maybe there's a, there's a specific instance or, or relationship that you've had on your heart this morning, and it doesn't feel good to think about it, but you know you need to give that over to Christ's Lordship. Maybe confessing that to someone or praying with someone about that would be life-giving to you this morning. Whatever decision or step God may be prompting in you, I'd encourage you to find me after service here. I'll just stay right up here at the front. Or get in touch with me this week if you're joining us online. Or if that's something you're still thinking about, feel free to contact me during this week, whatever it is. If not me, then connect with one of the elders or someone else on staff. Don't stay where you are. Don't keep living there. God's invitation to you is for so much more. Well, so glad you've all joined us this morning. Uh, be sure and join us next holiday weekend, July 4th, with no registration as we kick off our new series, Signs and Wonders. Again, no kids programming next week. Have a great rest of your weekend, and we will see you next week. Thanks for coming.